As you may know, the newest airliners of today have many incredible features to allow flying the aircraft to be easier and safer. Take the Boeing 787 Dreamliner for example, it has the ability to land itself, a highly advanced fly-by-wire system, and some of the quietest engines of any aircraft that flies today. The 787 first flew in 2009, as you'd probably expect from an aircraft capable of landing itself. However, you'd be wrong if you said the 787 was the first aircraft to have these abilities. Back in the early 1970s, the most sophisticated airplane of its time entered service. From an unlikely manufacturer, that made military aircraft like the SR-71 Blackbird, the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar first flew in November 1970. The TriStar could land itself just like the 787, yet it was built almost 40 years before the 787. In today's video, we're going to take a deeper look at one of the most forgotten advanced airliners ever built, and how it taught the aviation industry that you can build the better aircraft, but if your timing and business strategy are wrong, you will fail. <laughs> In the late 1960s, American Airlines approached McDonnell, Douglas, and Lockheed to make an airliner that could carry 250 passengers on transcontinental routes. Lockheed hadn't made a civilian airliner since 1961 with the L-188 Electra. Having difficulties with their military programs, Lockheed was eager to enter the wide-body jet market, and the response was the L-1011 TriStar, which took its first flight on November 16, 1970, only shortly after McDonnell Douglas's very similar DC-10 in August. The first testbed TriStar was registered as November 1011, and it had a striking livery with orange and red stripes down the sides of the fuselage. The TriStar had many similarities to its competitor aircraft. The DC-10 and L-1011 both had a three-engine layout with the famous number two engine on the tail. However, the DC-10 placed the center engine on the top of the fuselage for simpler and cheaper maintenance, while the L-1011 embedded the center engine in the rear fuselage with an S-duct, a more aerodynamic and efficient design. This gave the L-1011 the nickname, the Flying Tail, with the engine literally being part of it. The TriStar entered service with Eastern Airlines on April 26, 1972, almost a year after the DC-10. Unfortunately for Lockheed, American Airlines favored the DC-10 over the L-1011. This was because the TriStar's delivery was delayed because of issues with its Rolls-Royce RB211 524B engines, which gave the DC-10 a head start in the market. Despite the late start, airlines began ordering the aircraft, and in the next few years, the L-1011 had over 100 deliveries. The TriStar could carry 256 passengers in a two-class configuration, with 28 in business class and 228 in economy class. The L-1011 could also be configured in a high-density, all-economy layout with a max capacity of 384 passengers. Lockheed also made a long-range version of the TriStar. The stubby L-1011-500 could fly more than 6,300 miles. This variant was specifically designed to compete with the long-range McDonnell, Douglas, DC-1030, and 40. Compared to the DC-10, it seemed the L-1011 would win, no contest whatsoever. So why did the engineering marvel that can land itself in 1970 become a failure? Well, there are actually a few factors that contributed to the unsuccessful run of the L-1011. First of all, the Truster had catastrophic engine delays with its sole supplier, Rolls-Royce. The crushing development cost of the highly advanced RB211 caused the company to declare bankruptcy in 1971, forcing the British government to step in and finish the project. This crisis delayed the L-1011 by almost a full year, giving the DC-10 the market lead. Crucially, the efficient S-duct was also a reason for its failure, as it was designed specifically around the Rolls-Royce RB211's unique engine size. This meant that once Rolls-Royce went bankrupt, Lockheed had no backup engine manufacturer to turn to. Another challenge was the arrival of twin jets. The Airbus A300 was already demonstrating the efficiency of two-engine wide bodies. While ETOPS rules that truly killed the trijet market didn't arrive till later, the writing on the wall was that newer, more efficient twins would soon make three or four engine aircraft less economical for all but the longest routes. The final reason is the TriStar's highly advanced avionics. While it was a technological marvel with its auto land and fly-by-wire controls, all these features made the L-1011 significantly more expensive to purchase and maintain than the cheaper DC-10. Lockheed built the better plane, but airlines in the 1970s often prioritized the bottom line. In all, only 250 Lockheed L-1011 TriStars were ever built. The failure was so complete that Lockheed never produced another civilian airliner, ending its commercial aviation career forever. The TriStar could land itself, flew farther, and had the finest cabin in the sky, yet all these features became a financial anchor. Only one TriStar flies as of 2025. It is registered as November 140 Ciara Charlie, and it's owned by Northrop Grumman and is named Stargazer. It is currently used as a launch platform for small rockets. 
The L-1011 was indeed a failure, however, newer aircraft feature almost everything that TriStar had, from fly-by-wire flight controls to a comfortable cabin. Many things from the L-1011 are still influencing airliner designs today. The story of the L-1011 is certainly one of the most compelling and interesting in aviation history. It serves as the brutal reminder, you can build the better aircraft, but if your timing and business strategy are wrong, you will fail. What do you think of the L-1011? Did you know all these factors that led to its failure? If so, I hope you learned something new today. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the video. It really helps me create more videos just like this one. And with that, I'll catch you all in the next one. Bye!